The official story is that New Zealand was uninhabited until 800 years ago. The oral tradition, however, of the Maori tribes, the indigenous Polynesians that live in New Zealand, tell of legendary blonde fairy people living in hobbit-like burrows and red-haired giants that also roamed these islands in ancient times. So who were these blonde and red-headed populations that are described in these myths and what happened to them? The well-known Kiwi legend speaks of a time when the first canoes arrived only to find that there was already a race of blonde-haired fairies that lived in the forest and they were called the Patu Payare. Now the Maori respected these little people who were very elusive, rarely seen, uh, but they can hear them giggling and chuckling at night and rowing their small wakas, which are basically like canoes and their skin color was described as light or pale their hair was light and they were sometimes seen on the slopes of the misty mountains and they would come down to uh, to the sea to fish and this would usually take place in the evening at night when it was dark or very misty and as the legend says one early morning one of them were one of the Maori were said to have witnessed blonde people fishing and I presume they were startled and they took off but they left behind one of their nets which from then on was used by the Maori themselves who attribute this method of fishing technology to these little fairies. They also learned from them how to make a type of musical instrument, a flute that they carved and they were considered to be, you know, sort of magical people and upon occasion they would play their flute and lure away uh, and chant a woman and she would never be seen from again. There's another legendary race of fair-skinned people from New Zealand with golden hair and they were agriculturalists, they carved out amphitheaters and these people were said to be tall, had very white skin and were likely the origin of the famous tattoos that you see. Fully facial tattoo, which was only for the ones of high rank. People think everyone got tattoos in the old days, they're wrong. Five to ten percent at the most. You had to be something to deserve, especially a facial tattoo. The people that were basically here before we got here, okay? Well known to be, you know, tall, fair-skinned, um, definitely not little fairies. They are still around. They are all still blonde. Were these people real or not? They were. We've got a family, you know, who descend from them. There are modern blonde populations in New Zealand called the Waka Blondes. And they're Maori, but they have a distinct, different lineage than the Polynesian people. We've got uh, people in New Zealand who uh, were once described as the Waka Blondes. A lot of them actually have very traceable whakapapa that's much, much older than any of the uh, Polynesian Maori whakapapa and they know where they came from. Uh, I know one uh, individual, uh, an old kuia, a very dignified lady who uh, claims to come out of Persia and the area that she's talking about, very close to India. And um, when we did DNA analysis on this lady, uh, it shows a high incidence of her blood group or her DNA in the Persian area, so she's quite correct. But then the second big uh, block, if you like, of people that share her DNA are found in Peru. This is very interesting as it concurs almost exactly with a Maori legend recorded over a hundred years ago by ethnologist Elsden Best when he was living amongst the Tuhoi people. The legend tells us that their ancestors in times long passed away, 165 generations or around three and a half thousand years ago, migrated from a hot country named India. The cause of this exodus 
was a disastrous war with the dark-skinned folk in which great numbers were slain. This war was recorded in the Indian epic known as the Mahabharat. The legend continues on to describe their voyages which eventually took them into Polynesia. They crossed the oceans to Tafiti Roa, a long skinny land believed to be Central America, and then on to Tafiti Nui, a very large land, South America. And from there, they ventured into the scattered isles of the Pacific. This two-hoy story describes a very different history to the one that asserts that the Polynesians came from Taiwan, and it could even turn Pacific prehistory on its head. We came from the, this ancient place outside of Egypt named ancient Persia. Today it is named Iran or Iran, whichever way you want to say it. When I told my family, oh, they were proud when I told them that they came from ancient Persia. Some of them said, oh, are we Arabs? Yeah. I said, well, actually, we'd be described as being Egyptian. Yeah. more than Arabs. <laughs> we couldn't believe our eyes when we first saw Monica's family. Right in front of us was a living representation of the green-eyed, golden-haired people we've been looking for. They're not just fairy folk of the forest or mythical beings. They are real. This ancient Iranian or Aryan bloodline incidentally is the same that we find in the oldest mummies found in China which like most of the mummies in ancient Egypt are blonde and red-headed and have caucasoid features. The mummies from China don't look like they should be in China. They look like they should be in Denmark or Ireland or northern Germany because they look like people from over there. DNA steps up to the plate and they can tell us where they came from. Well before the opening of the Silk Road, which is dated to 138 BC, these mummies date back, some of them, to 2000 BC. The uh, female mummies were mostly of local origin. However, there's another type of testing, the Y chromosome testing, which is the male line. The males came from parts further west, not necessarily Ireland, but places like Iran, maybe towards uh, parts of Turkey. The mom's side and the grandmother's side is from the Tarim Basin and the father's and the grandfather's side were moving in with their sheep, with their herds, slowly but surely, and having families. Geneticists have compared mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey, concluding that people with blue eyes have a single common ancestor that lived by the Black Sea around 8,000 years ago and spread out with agriculture. Professor Eiberg from the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Copenhagen said, and I quote, the first blue-eyed humans were among the Proto-Indo-Europeans who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. It's called Filefot in England, Hawken Cruz in Germany, Tetra Gamadion in Greece, Wan in China, Manji in Japan, and Swastika in India. In his 1896 book, The Swastika, the earliest known symbol and its migrations, Thomas Wilson, former curator of the Department of Prehistoric Anthropology in the U.S. National Museum wrote of the swastika, and I quote, an Aryan symbol used by the Aryan peoples before their dispersion throughout Asia and Europe. This might even serve as an explanation how, as a sacred symbol, the swastika might have been carried to different peoples in which we now find it by the splitting up of Aryan peoples and their migrations and establishment in various parts of Europe. There are populations in modern Iran, such as the Kurds, 
specifically the Yazidi, who unlike their Arab and Islamic oppressors, are Indo-European people and Adnan Kokar, chairman of the Kurdish Cultural Center in London, said that, and I quote, the Kurds and Yazidis are originally Aryans, but because the Yazidis are such a closed community, they have retained their fair complexion, blonde hair, and blue eyes. ISIS has taken around 300 women from Zinjar to give to jihadists to marry and make pregnant. If they can't kill all Yazidis, they will try to smash their blonde bloodline. Here is a video where mercenary militants explain their agenda, which includes ethnic genocide and interracial sex slavery, specifically mentioning genetic features targeted, such as blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Many people are unaware that in the 1930s, the German government under Hitler sent archaeological expeditions to Asia in search of ancestral links between blonde Germans and ancient Buddhist and other proto-Indo-Europeans which the Nazis believed were connected to them linguistically, culturally, and indeed genetically. Today, academia and the media laugh at this, but academia and the media are still controlled by the same winners of World War II. The Buddhas of Bamiyan are massive monumental statues erected millennia ago along the Silk Road in the Bamiyan Valley which runs through the Hindu Kush mountain region in Afghanistan. These caves were inhabited by monks which not only left mummies but also ancient depictions of themselves. Now, when the Muslims came along, many of the caves were destroyed. In fact, the caves were used as residences, and the tar from the fire covered many of the paintings inside, and that sort of saved those paintings. They've been able to remove the tar deposits from the fires of the last few centuries, and they have found Buddhist paintings, some of them of great beauty and color, inside the caves. A tremendous Buddhist religious complex. The large Buddha is 175 feet high, probably the biggest in all of the world. And here's what remains of it. The face was cut away many centuries ago when the Muslims took over this area. But there are Huddle and David at the bottom there to give you an idea of size. And you're looking up 175 feet. And above its head, above the head of this statue, we could see very unusual paintings. We were told it might be possible to go up there and see the paintings at close range. We see the red beard and uh, red hair. It's a shame that these figures have all been defaced by people of other faiths at some time in the past. But it's uh, still, it's very easy to see what they looked like and we can tell who they were. He's got the red beard, uh, red hair parted in the middle. The statues that you've seen, the caves themselves, are 50. 1500 or more years old. And one last look at that magnificent big Buddha, 175 feet high, carved in these cliffs 1500 years ago.
Nestled in the mountains between France and Spain, there is a semi-isolated population of native European people that have long puzzled anthropologists, linguists, and historians because although they are Caucasoid, they do not fit in with the rest of the European population. Their language, for example, is distinctly unique in Europe and not related to any other Indo-European language. But that's not the only thing that's unique about the Basque. The Basque turned out to also be unique in terms of blood. Prior to the advent of genetic research tools, investigators used the ABO blood groups to study the relationships between human populations as well as their migration patterns. Each person's blood is one of four major types, A, B, AB, or O. Blood types are determined by the types of antigens on the blood cells. Antigens are proteins on the surface of blood cells that can cause a response from the immune system. The Rh factor is a type of protein on the surface of red blood cells. Most people are Rh positive. Those who do not have the Rh factor are Rh negative which compromises about 15% of the world's population, but appears in much higher percentage among the Basque, which as a population contain among the highest levels of Rh negative blood in the world. The Basque people currently inhabit the area surrounding the Pyrenees Mountains, where Cro-Magnon man left behind some of his and her most famous artwork over 30,000 years ago, but exactly who are the Basque and where did they come from? I decided that a great place to find out is the University of Nevada since it houses the Center for Basque Studies. This organization is primarily a research center that conducts and publishes on Basque related topics such as anthropology, history, cultural studies, etc. Here is what they had to say about the Basque people and their origins, and this comes from their website's Frequently Asked Questions. Question. Where did the Basque come from? No one knows exactly where the Basque come from. Some say they have lived in the area since Cro-Magnon man first roamed Europe. Some say they are descended from the original Iberians. More fanciful theories exist as well. One is that the Basques are the descendants of the survivors of Atlantis. Question. Where did the Basque language come from? Just as no one is sure about the origins of the Basque themselves, linguists are not in agreement over the origins of Uskara, the Basque language, either. When asked, I found that the majority of the Basque people themselves maintain that they came from Atlantica, a powerful maritime nation that sank into the Atlantic Ocean after a terrible cataclysm and from which a few survivors reached the Bay of Biscay and the Pyrenees Mountains. This, they say, is not just mythology, but their true pre-European ancestry. There's another ancient people who claim racial lineage from the mythical Atlanteans. The Berbers are currently located geographically around Mount Atlas, but inhabit much of North Africa long before the Arabs arrived. The Berbers are considered the aboriginals of the area, and their origins beyond that are not officially known. Here we have a population, many of whom have blue eyes and light hair, living in northwest Africa of all places, and among some of the blonde tribes still living near the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, the percentage of Rh negative blood can reach 40%. Now keep in mind, that's not the general uh, national average, but restricted to certain local tribes. Anthropologists, for the most part, dismissed them for many years because they didn't fit well with the out of Africa paradigm. So it was presumed that they had migrated from somewhere in Europe. However, that theory has been abandoned with the current understanding of genetics. Scientists now accept the genetic evidence 
That concludes Berbers are an indigenous, indigenous people, which they believe are descended from native Upper Paleolithic Cro-Magnon types going straight back into the Pleistocene or Ice Age. This should make it easier to understand why the oldest remains found in Egypt, nicknamed Ginger, and currently on display in the British Museum, has naturally red hair. This is pre-dynastic, which means before the pharaohs and before the accepted dating of the pyramids. I can go on for quite some time about blonde and red-headed mummies and blue-eyed statues but I'll save that for a future video on ancient Egypt. For now, let us turn to another population native to an island off of the African coast who also left mummies and pyramids. The Guanches were very tall, powerfully built, blonde and red-haired indigenous natives of the Canary Islands, specifically the island of Tenerife. To date, there is still no evidence that the Guanches had any knowledge of maritime technology, which begs the question, how did they get there? This isolation allowed the Guanche to maintain a racial exclusivity until the time of the Spanish conquest. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, concerning the ethnic origins and racial identity of the Canary Island Guanches, and I quote, the Guanches are thought to have been of Cro-Magnon origin with blue or gray eyes and blondish hair. Madame Blavatsky, foundress of the Theosophical Society, points out that the genetic relations between these three populations, well over a hundred years before our modern understanding of DNA, uh, and I quote, she says, if then the Basque and Cro-Magnon cavemen are of the same race as the Canaries Guanches, it follows that the former are also allied to the Aborigines of America. The Atlantean affinities of the three types becomes patent. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm a formerly educated anthropologist and now author, and I'd like to invite you to explore some fascinating mysteries with me, which for the most part have eluded any serious consideration in mainstream academia. Species with Amnesia, Our Forgotten History, and Gods with Amnesia, Subterranean Worlds of Inner Earth. I'd like to thank those of you who share my passion of ancient history, archaeology, and continue to support me in my work. So I appreciate it and all the encouragement. Thank you.